to voiceover or not to voiceover. Hmm. I, isn't that that's how it goes, right? It, it's something like that. And then does do you hear the tree when it falls? No, no, that's not the right <laughs> saying either. Uh, we might be confusing a few things. Yes, uh, but yes to voiceover. I would say yes to voiceover. I say yes too. Mm-hmm. Well, there we go. Actually, saying yes is a part of activating your voice, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, no, nah. I, I, I make the connections as well as, as well as get the lines confused. But um, so and not to talk about lines that you would perform. Oh, wait, I just did. Anyway, what I think we would I'm so somebody please in the comments, tell us what we're talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we're talking about voiceover. And, you know, it's funny. We use the phrase finding your voice in a very specific way. Um, it's, it's obviously not the literal voice, but of course it can be. And I guess it would be fair to accuse us of two people who have done that in a more literal sense than most. Mm. That's very philosophical. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I played. think also it would be fun. For, oh, thank you. Um, I, I think it would also be fun for us to talk about these voiceover things from from, from a broad range of perspectives. Yeah. And maybe we'll start talking about the sort of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and then and then go into more specified areas. Sounds good to me. All right, man. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Heart of the Cards, a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Hey, this is Dan Green. And Eric Stewart. And this is episode 27 of the Heart of the Cards. And we're talking all about voiceover stuff. What a surprise. Probably... A, yeah, what a surprise. Probably a subject we'll return to more than once. Yes. yes. So, Eric. I'm excited. I am too. What was your first gig? My first gig. So, while I was working at the recording studio, um, Reel to Reel, and I was um, I was an assistant casting director and um, also the guy that made coffee and things like that and answered the phone, um, there was a commercial for Enterprise Rent-A-Car. It was a campaign and remember those guys they needed someone to just basically say enterprise rent a car jimmy speaking i think that was my line um dude you still got it i know right i still sound like the 18 year old kid that said that line um <laughs> and they called me into the to the studio i was you know obviously making coffee or something and they were like hey eric sure. we need you to say this one line and i became like you know jimmy from enterprise rent a car for i think it was three <laughs> radio commercials and I got to okay. work with a very, very funny lady named Joyce Reeling, um, who people okay. might know from from a lot of like Law and Orders and things like that. Like just an unbelievably talented and very, very funny lady. Um, oh, that's awesome! So I, of course, I knew her from you know being involved in the casting that was going on there just mm-hmm, normally. Mm-hmm. So I knew how mm-hmm. <laughs> funny she was. I was more intimidated by being in the booth with her than I was uh, by the 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 job itself. Um, but she was very kind, and she held my hand through it, probably literally as well. Um, and we got to, and we got to be the sort of the, you know, I was the the the, the straight man in the in the gig, um, yeah, yeah. And she was the the, the comedic uh, uh, partner, and we did a bunch of these spots together, and that was actually the job that earned me enough money to join SAG. That was my... Oh, wow. That, there you yeah. Go. Um, so I was really excited about that. Um, but yeah, that was my first gig. And it was it was fun. Like, it was it was fun to play off of uh, the other person. Um, the, the comedic timing back and forth uh, was something mm-hmm. that I was used to just as a person. Um, and obviously, I had mm-hmm. been involved in directing that sort of uh, comedic approach to things. But it really is such a dance. Uh, between two people. Um, you can mm-hmm. see the other person across from you. Now, just to give somebody a, a sense of being in the booth together with someone, sometimes you'll you'll be working on the same mic, just facing each other like nose to nose, which is not ideal. Mm-hmm. A better thing is to be on two different mics, still facing each other, kind of, but maybe on like mm-hmm. a 15 degree angle. So you see their body and you can see them move, but you're also still kind of facing the glass looking into mm-hmm. the control room so that you can also mm-hmm. make eye contact with the director when they're speaking to you, things like that. So you start to really learn how to feel someone about to speak in their body motion 
Sure. To not do it all the time. To not step on their lines. Sure. Um, Mm -hmm. And that and that itself is is uh, is a skill that um, doing doing these two character spots. I I was really um, learning how to do. Um, And I still do it Mm -hmm. to this day. I, you know, out of out of the the corners of my eye or, um, you know, you Mm -hmm. and I have been on stage together when we do Q&A's and we know when the other one is going to speak. We feel, usually we yeah we feel that we feel that so that was my first yeah, yeah. experience and it was um it was fantastic and and what about you what was your very first voiceover my first gig was shortly after I graduated I was freshly in New York City and I don't know how I got so fortunate to be able to audition for uh, there's the show um, the History Channel. Yeah. used to have, maybe they still do, have this show called Biography. And as you might guess from the title, it was about people's lives. And I got to read as, uh, you, you know, sometimes they have what people said about that subject, and sometimes they have things that that subject wrote, said themselves. And, and so I got to be Amadeus Mozart. Whoa. I, I don't know if that episode is still out there. And... Anyway, that that made me feel pretty cool, just because of I can just say Mozart. Yeah, you know, did that's you like? Did you get a prep? really well known guy? Did you get prep for that? How did you? How did you even like know? I mean, that's auditioned over the phone into what they call an answering machine at the time. Wow. Let me say that again. Auditioned over the phone into what they called an answering machine. I think at the time, something like that. So. What did you use? I mean, obviously, there's some movies where people have portrayed, uh, you know, Mozart. But but what did you use as a reference way back then in the time of, you know, answering machines um, to even find something as a starting point? So I'm approaching this as an actor. They asked actors to do this. So I'm just using tools that I'm already used to using. And... The impression I got from um, Amadeus, the movie that's probably the most popular or well-known yeah. Mozart movie, uh, which I had watched years ago, mm-hmm. uh, but that certainly made an impression, Tom Hulse's wonderful performance. Yep. Did he win the Academy Award? I know that um, F. Murray Abraham wore, won for supporting, I, I believe. Anyway, but um, such a such a unique personality, mm-hmm. right? So that passion you know and that playfulness and and what have you um certainly was a was a clear reference wow. and i and i wasn't being asked to imitate that right but it also boils down to what the actual passages are what the w- words being said are right and those should give you a sense of where the person's coming from yep that's true um, that's true and uh yeah so that's cool anyway yeah um but yeah that that, that was cool now a different but perhaps even more important question. When did you become aware that you could use your voice like an artist? Hmm. Well, um, that may happen before or after working. It did. And so I, right. I was good at doing, you know, my versions of impersonations as, as a kid. Um, you know, even from a very early age, it was all about, um, giving big speeches, you can ask my mother when I was, even before I could talk, and I mean, make sense of what I was saying, and I don't know if I've ever reached that point even in my life now, but um, I would stand up on like the coffee table as a baby and just give big speeches of nonsense. Um, It was always about that. So, um, you know, probably fourth, fifth grade, I was, you know, imitating different uh, people that I, that I loved. Um, uh, when I when I got to that new school, sure, I think I, sure. I talked about the fact that uh, Robin Williams, Mork, uh, Mork and Mindy was yeah. one of my favorite shows. And yeah. I could do a great yeah. Robin Williams at that, you know, at that time um, and mm-hmm. made my friends laugh. So there were things that I that I knew that I could do. And then, of course, once I started to um, play a little bit of music, I still was not singing, really, because I was so afraid of that. But um, mm-hmm. doing funny stuff. Doing funny voices was something so that, that, that I did. So that revealed to you what you could achieve with your voice. You could captivate an audience. You could make people laugh. Yeah. You could also, uh, you mentioned um, doing an, an imitation of uh, Robin Williams at the time. Yep. 
And let's let's explore that vein a little bit. So, you know, we have a sound that is um, unique in a sense, but also we can be categorized, obviously, with you know, yep. pe- you know, like with your, if you're putting out a casting. Yes. But, um, but how much was learning to imitate certain vocal aspects uh, a helpful ingredient to your to your recipe making? See, I think I sold the impersonation that I was doing or the or the attempt at that in my yeah. physicality. I yeah, I not, was ju- also, not the voice itself. Yes, I was very physically funny too with these characters um learning the, the all those gestures. I mean, I to this day I still st- I'm physically funny too, but not in a way that makes people laugh. <laughs> Yes. Well, <laughs> I can I can say that that's probably true of me as well. But um I I um I still study um how performers move. I mean, my mother being a dancer, I'm I'm always aware of movement. Um but I also find that so much of that from stage presence, mm-hmm. especially as a as a musical performer, um yeah. is so important and yet has nothing to do with what I do as a voice actor. But in the beginning of Mm -hmm. making those funny voices, I also had the crutch of the physicality that I was able to bring to it, which now I, as a director, I even discuss with people. I say, look, you know, know, if, if you close your eyes and you're not watching that person do all these gestures or movement, and you're really just focusing on that dialect or, or that voice, you might say, that's terrible, <laughs> or that's not really that good. But because of the physicality, you might. Well, it doesn't just... have life in it, and, and also maybe lacking a certain right. And I'm just talking about being like, like dead on, like you know, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, like a New yeah. York, you know, a mobster thing that you're doing. Um, if you're gesturing with your hands and you're and you're shrugging your shoulders and you're doing all this stuff on stage, you your 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 accent might be passable, but not great. But um, mm-hmm. Because you're watching the whole if physical thing tied in with the voice on the side. Month, but if you just closed your Patreon eyes and didn't page, watch that actor do all the gesturing and just focused on the accent, you might say it's not if that this solid. Is content right, enjoyed, it's going in and out. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. you know, later in life, I realized that a lot of these um, impersonations or these accents and things that I that I was doing as a kid, as I started to even think of this as something I might do um, for a living, um, there are accents and things like that that I actually turn down. I turn them down in auditions because I just don't think that I do them that well. And I'd it's rather, good to know what you what yeah. your strengths are, which obviously means identifying your weaknesses. Yeah, you know, and, if and, you want to p- phrase it that way. Yeah. But, yeah, and it's not like I couldn't learn it if I was like given right. an opportunity. You like, just, hey, man, just, but it's, it's not in your back pocket or yeah. that old expression, your wheelhouse. Yeah. yeah. So, so when someone says, "Hey, can you do this thing?" I might, I might go, "Hey, you know what? You know who does this better than I do? My, you know, my buddy Dan <laughs> Green. Like that. This might be his thing." Um, but it, and and I and I, I mean, maybe that's. Uh, rare to to uh, address your strengths and weaknesses that way. Um, you know, I don't want to say that I know how to yeah. do everything all the time. I think that once you sure. then do it, you'll prove either you can or can't. Right. So why not? Yeah, I'd say you know, don't you don't don't say that you can do an accent that you either are capable of doing uh, or are willing to learn. Yeah, and 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 just yeah. as a side note to that, and, and know that you can. Yeah, and know that you can. But but yeah. when, and I'm sure we'll get into the discussion of demo reel stuff like that. But just as a quick uh, yeah. side note to, yeah. to what I just mentioned, another reason sure. why you shouldn't put anything on your demo reel that you don't do so well. Right? Don't just put like little. You know, I kind of do a good British mm-hmm. accent. No, then don't put that on yeah, there, right? No. Right? Don't put it on, right? Um, so it, yeah, so yeah, I always say, I always say, this is to show you off. Yes, right. Yep. If it doesn't show you off, it's not on the, it's not on the demo. So to answer yeah. your question in the long way I got around it, I think that I realized <laughs> my vocal talent probably um, fourth or fifth grade. And, uh, right, and I'll throw right. it back at you. What about you? Because I know you also are, you know, you were doing stage acting. Uh, you know, that was something sure, you liked. Sure. I I didn't even, that, that was not even on my radar to be an actor. We have very different approaches to this, right? So as an actor, I didn't think that there was anything particularly special about my voice. I knew I could be loud. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I could, I, uh, could make people laugh. And I used to lip sync... Steve Martin albums. I think I brought that up once. Um, and 
that gives you, but but again, similar to yourself, to you know what you were saying about physicality. I was imagining, even though I hadn't really seen much video of Steve Martin, the, the whole thing. I wasn't just trying to say things and phrase things the way right. he was doing so. Right. I was recreating the nightclub, mm-hmm. whatever the recording was. Right. <laughs> like you do when you lip sync. Yeah. And <laughs> so, um, but in terms of focusing on the voice. That awareness, I, I, I sang a bit in, in high school. I was in the choirs, including a cappella, which was considered, you know, like the, an elite choir. Yeah. Um, I was in the Music Man, and I, and I, as Harold Hill, the lead, and I was the lead in West Side Story, even though I wasn't really a tenor. And thank God there were only four performances because my voice gave out after the last one. Wow. But um, yeah, whoo, just notes that I not. Not good, but anyway. But I had I, I had com- you know some some affirmation that my voice sounded good, but I had no sense of it you know really uh, just beyond that because there were other people in choir, other people who I thought sang well, and so um, certainly had no focus on oh I'm going to be a vocal performer. Um, and in I the the training I got you you focus on the voice, but that's in the context of using it on stage mm-hmm. more than anything, right? So, but it did attenuate, you know, a specificity of what what you can do with the voice, and you know, we did all the phonetics and stuff. So, I, I'm really glad I have that that education. But um, yeah, but I so in, in terms of becoming aware of like using my voice specifically, um, I I always loved audio, as I've mentioned before, and so I would resort to my voice. And I was I, like I also mentioned I was singing on a four track recorder yeah, yeah. to make songs. But in, in in a weird way, that was me trying to make my voice sound not like a voice. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, right. I'm simulating a, a rhythm track or I'm doing something yeah. that horns would do. Or, yeah. You know, or just backup singer. Right. Yeah. You know, so anyway. But uh, but I, yeah, I mean, I, so I, I think it just kind of grew out of a love of sound. And as a, you know, we recently did a podcast about how I like storytelling and, and express it or, or explore it in, in different ways. So, yeah, it, it was kind of like that. Yeah, and, and then and then I'm you know I fall into doing some voiceover work. Right, right. So I was going to say that the the other thing is I, I I mean even though we both grew up watching cartoons and had yeah. some favorite you know voice acting characters, um, even though we understood that that was a career at least for me, I didn't think like that's all that you did unless you were Mel Blanc. Like, and even he had an on-camera presence, you know, Um, but like, I really didn't think that there were, you know, at that time, hundreds and hundreds of, 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 of cartoon voice actors who only did that. I thought, oh, these are paying jobs for thousands of voice actors. Right. These are act, these are actors (laughs) who happen to also do some voiceovers. And that's, that's what that is, especially, Mm -hmm. especially commercial Mm -hmm. stuff. I always thought that, you know, on air personalities, that's one thing, but the, the voiceover personalities, well, that was just their account. And sometimes it would be people we knew, like when Tom Selleck was doing like a commercial for orange juice, just to date myself. Um, things like that where <laughs> hey I date you too yes thank you where, oh wait a minute that's not how you no, no. <laughs> but where you where you you recognize the, the the actor and you realize that that's not the only thing that they're doing they're also Magnum PI right so right. so well, and also to to this is aligned with what you're saying the idea that you would have as an actor an exclusive career as a cartoon yeah. animated you know, right. anime voice actor. Right. Um, I mean, surely there, you know, you, you see like uh, Casey Kasem, yep. one of your favorites. Yep. Right. You, yeah. You track him throughout the years and he has the animation stuff that he does. Right. But most of those people are doing other things. But then I think this is the point I was I wanted to get to. I think it was a Little Mermaid where it suddenly, or Beauty and the Beast, I'm not sure which, where it, it was suddenly respectable for actors to like big league actors yeah to what, do beauty and the right? beast yeah you get your angela lansbury's yeah. who uh, you know Jer- awesome jerry orbach but, yeah i mean there was yeah that, that was right. like an like yeah academy award-winning I, actors who happen to be doing a cartoon right. <laughs> yes <laughs> right so i think yeah i think in in maybe the later 80s and in early 90s it, it it's it changed the way that these were made and that's why you get angelina jolie in a very small role in kung fu panda right but it's angelina jolie Right. You know, yes. She does a great job. But, yes. Yes. <laughs> you know. But yeah, it did change that, and I think yeah. But I think what you know, based on you know, we are semi close in age. Based on that, we both grew yeah, up without uh, without that really being sort of like the thing, the only right. thing you do as an actor. I'm a voice actor. <laughs> um, so, right. So that right. was it. That was an education as well. Um, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Very cool. So. 
We could obviously talk about your voice work as a singer, songwriter. Right. Uh, that's a, a conversation perhaps left for another another day. All good. Because, you know, right. So um, so you have a sense of what you can do creatively with your voice. You get a job, and you have other creative outlets, right? So you're not just, as you've said many times, your your, your music is what defines you, mm-hmm. and your voiceover work is, is work that you love doing. Yes. But that's, that's your day job. That is my job. Yes. Right, right. Uh, so... For the job part of it, mm-hmm. for the for the the wisdom that you've learned over the years, oh right, yes, um, yeah. Um, what would you say to one of the many people who who come up to us at a convention and say, "I want to get into voiceover work. What do I do?" Hmm. Yeah, you know it's interesting because I I really feel like a lot of the industry has changed so much since we've been in it since we started in it, um, the amount of people that uh, are pursuing it, are doing it, the the amount of choices producers and directors now have because everybody wants sure. to do voice acting. Um, yes. Uh, you know, there there's a way to be sort of intimidated by it because there are so many people trying to pursue the same thing. And there's also a way to realize that even if you are um, an established person, you're still constantly competing for these roles, trying to get these gigs. But if Absolutely. You, but if but what I've what I have learned in the I guess it's coming up on 35 years now um of being in this crazy business. What I have learned is I I set it and forget it. I there are so many times that I audition for uh, multiple things in a day where if I added up the potential income and how great it would be to get all these things, I could retire right there. That would be fantastic. Um, But I've gotten to the point now where if you asked me what I auditioned for yesterday, my response would probably be, oh, there was this one really dumb script. Can't remember what the product was. And then there was this funny thing I had to do a character. I don't really remember. Um... (laughs) <laughs> I don't really remember because I don't hold on to it. Now, if they call me right, back right, in right. a week and say they want to use you, I should actually go and listen to what I did as an audition. But I I don't hold on to it. And I learned to, to just forget it because I'm not in control of it anymore. I'm only in control of my audition. Um, and sometimes mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. that... Uh, because of some of the direction I'm given or feedback from my agent after I do hand it in and they say, uh, you know, can you do it like a little bit more like this? And sometimes I might even push back and go, I don't think that's the way that it should be done, but okay, if that's what we're doing. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I I feel like if I, if I can let it go like that and just be like, well, I did my part. I did the best I, uh, of me. I did the best Eric I could do here. And now I'm moving on. It's the only way that I can at least uh, not drive myself crazy with that part of it. But the other thing I would yeah. say to someone who wanted to get into it, you know, the the idea of acting, the idea of even uh, playing with your friends where you're acting out parts and just any time you can act is going to help you in this crazy world of voiceovers. Yep. Um, yep. Learning how to listen is so important. Um, Mm -hmm. And and Mm -hmm. you would learn so much if you sat in on a session watching a director direct an actor and what that actor gave back, even if if you sat in that room and didn't do anything besides just listen. You would see- That's exactly what happens in an acting class. And you learn a lot of stuff when you're not the one in the scene. Mm Mm-hmm. And you learn a lot of stuff watching the work and seeing what the teacher says about yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah. no, as an assistant casting director, when I first started, you know, at Real to Real, um, I, I, production assistant first, and then oh, assistant, Real to Real, yes, right. I you. I would sit in on all casting yeah, sessions yeah, and all yeah. radio production sessions, voiceover sessions. Just sit on the back couch, the, the couch in the back of the room, and just watch some of the best. Uh, voice actors, uh, you know, that I, th- in New York City, um, being directed by a great director um, and just mm-hmm. absorb it like a sponge. So, you, yep. know, you know, those that want to do this, um, I'm also, uh, you know, I'm wary of of the promises, the 
um, you know, you, oh, you know, this, yeah. this business is, yeah, you know, we you'll do so well, we you do this. The, yeah. We could yeah. definitely go into that. But I, I think that if people really want to do it, they find someone who, you know, a great place to study, like a great coach, uh, uh, or do some acting with other people. If you're still in school, you know, see if you can mm-hmm. join that theater group. If you're not in school, see if you can get some of your friends together and just do some improv together, do some fun stuff where you are acting. Um, but don't, just go out and say, all right, I'm going to make a demo reel. I'm going to write my own scripts. I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to, and I'm going to be a success at that. And even if you are, even if you do do something that gets you that, that amazing first gig, because you just, you know, whatever you, the right time at the right place. Um, it, that's not the way this business works. It's, it's a roller coaster ride. You know, you, you need to understand that, uh, the trends change of what people are looking for based on the economy of like how much money is out there and people are spending. Do I want someone yelling at me to spend my money because they're excited about it? Yeah. And then when it's a little mm. bit more like a tighter times with, with our wallets, you know, we need our, our best friend, our our confidant giving us financial advice. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So so mm-hmm. you might be the wrong voice type or the, the, the wrong age, you know, for, for what the Democrats sure. are looking for. So you might yeah. be the hottest thing in the world, you know, one month and then the next month you're like, wait a second, why, why isn't anyone sending me anything, anything to audition for? Because things have shifted. So, right. Yeah. And what, and what about you? What, what I, I know you do, you do a ton more coaching than I do now. I don't do that much anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have a Mm -hmm. lot of one-on-one, um, advice for for these people on, on a regular basis. Well, okay. So, I'm going to uh, answer the question, but I'm also going to suggest that we should probably get more into this in part two. Okay. But let's, but well, or at least at least to say that this is definitely a subject matter that we have to do as a two part episode because because we haven't nearly begun even to yeah, yeah. Know, scratch the surface. So yet. so you can do so, your you can do your advice to give someone right. Yeah. So the advice to give someone, uh, usually it's somebody who wants to have the kind of career that they imagine you and I having. So they want to do anime or animation, usually specifically anime. But um, so to that person, I say, as any teacher would, acting is the most important part of voice acting. Now, what you just covered also included commercial stuff, too. Right. What are the what are the trends in the commercial field right now? And that's an important, more lucrative area, usually um, uh, of voiceover work than acting. And. A lot of commercial stuff, while it's performance, I wouldn't necessarily define it as acting, even though there's a lot of stuff that is similar. But um, but when it comes to like playing a character in a story, yeah, that's that's acting. So acting is the most important part of voice acting. Nobody cares how you sound if you can't get your way through a scene or a line. And I always encourage people uh, to act beyond just being in front of a microphone. I reinforce to them that most of the colleagues of mine that they admire do stage and other forms of performance, and they embrace their creativity very thoroughly in ways that you may not have ever heard in a cartoon, even though you've watched everything they've recorded, right? There's there's this creative life and skill set that is developed outside of the booth, having nothing to do with the booth. So... Getting to them to open their minds in that way is, is crucial, as well as understanding that if your focus, if your goal is only to do anime, that's definitely a target you can hit, but it's very limiting, which is not denigrating anime at all. But it is but a sliver that you sometimes gain a lot of attention for. Right. We, we have we have experienced that. Yes. And right? that, that's definitely but a we, bonus to to that genre. But it is. And we are yeah. so grateful for yes. it. But in this assessment of um, how much work is that, there's a lot more work that isn't that. Yes, that is true. I have told many yeah. a fan that that they're like, well, you know, um, they ask which which voice uh, do you know is my favorite this and that and you know uh, yeah you know what yeah, and I, we always get the what's your favorite <laughs> and I'll say to them you know I do most of my my, my work is me talking like me like yeah. it's not me doing yeah. a character 
And they're like, what? What are you right. talking about? I'm like, yeah, well, you know me for the characters <laughs> I play, but like, that's not my main source of income. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Right. <laughs> From their perspective, it's puzzling. Yeah. I actually uh, had someone yeah. say to me they wanted to get into voice acting and do this kind of stuff. And I was like, great. And we had this nice, you know, long conversation about the right, you know, the way to approach this, whatever. And then I, I finally said, well, what, is, what are your goals? Like, what are you trying to do? And they yeah. said, I want to yeah. be able to go to conventions and sign autographs like you do. And I said, <laughs> I can't help you. I said, I can't help you. Yeah. Like, I can't yeah. help you because yeah. like, even if you're, if you're, you're successful and you're working on a, a popular show, that's, that's, not, I can't guarantee that. And also like, that's that's I mean, it's a very, very important part of what we do. We we love to meet the fans. We love the experience. It's fantastic. But oh, my goodness, I don't I don't think that was even something I thought was going to ever happen doing what we do. That's such a bonus. I, oh, yes. I always make a point of saying that at appearances. Never thought I'd be there. Yeah. And so that yeah. can't be. I mean, yeah. I, I, do I love that yeah. part of it? Sure. And should that be something right. that you like if you were offered yeah. that opportunity, you you jump at and you, yeah. and you have a great time doing it. But if that's why you're becoming a voice actor, I can't coach you with that. Yeah. And the way I've reflected back to students who say essentially the same thing is I can't make lightning strike. <laughs> Right. But I can help you be prepared for when it does. Yes, yes, yes. With skills. Yes. Um, obviously not literally lightning, though, because well, I'm useless there. Well, you never know. <laughs> but let's let's bring this uh, part of this conversation to a close yep. for this ep- part one of episode 27. Wow. And uh, thanks again, Eric. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I can't wait to keep on pursuing this subject. Yeah. And thank you especially to all of our followers and listeners uh, our new ones on Spotify, hopefully we're uh, reaching out to some people there. Actually, this episode won't be on Spotify for a while because I have so many more to upload <laughs> from our back catalog. But uh, that's Impressive. an exciting Impressive. development. Yes, and other uh, Spotify and other podcast providers. And um, and everyone who's following us on YouTube, please continue following us. Uh, we don't want the YouTube channel to feel lonely. And uh, But most especially, uh, thank you for listening to what we're saying and reflecting back what matters to you when we get the fortune to meet you and in these appearances or when we hear from you uh, virtually on our socials or online. We, we just are so happy that you are part of this continuing conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Thanks for listening to The Heart of the Cards with Dan Green and Eric Stewart. We hope this conversation in some way spoke to you. Whatever your journey, we look forward to crossing paths again in the next episode. This is Veronica Taylor, and on behalf of Andromeda Productions, we wish you well. Andromeda, always a sound choice. <laughs>